I just took him on. I just, we just engaged into this. You know, he sees, he's seeing me coming now. He's swinging his nice. We're going backwards and forwards, keeping, and just keeping a distance from him. And I managed to stab him with the Norwell Tusk and hit him in the chest. I remember saying to, to, to there's people out there, you know, no, there's people out there on London Bridge. I haven't a clue what's just about to hit them. I see these ladies walking towards him, completely oblivious. I just, I thought, Mr. Lamb, so I shouted, get back, it's a terrorist. Get back, it's a terrorist. Welcome back to Crisis What Crisis, the podcast that aims to guide you towards a more resilient life and whatever it might throw at you. If this is your first time with us, then please hit subscribe wherever you're watching or listening. It really does help make sure that these, I hope, useful conversations are shared as widely as possible. Now, over the last few years, we've been lucky enough to have guests who've shared their crisis stories from a range of different perspectives as a result of war, terror, illness, accidents, trauma from events that have come out of a blue sky. Today's conversation is with someone who's experienced. Well, if you dreamed it up for a film script, would be dismissed as too far-fetched, just too unlikely to be real. In 2005, Steve Gallant was convicted of murder after carrying out a brutal uh, revenge attack on a man, Barry Jackson, who he claimed had assaulted his then-girlfriend. He was given a life sentence with a minimum term of 17 years. Not long after being sentenced, Steve took a vow to never again use violence, a vow he somehow managed to keep as he navigated his way for the next decade and a half through the prison system, a system where random violence can come from anywhere at any time. Steve educated himself in prison, embracing pretty much every opportunity for rehabilitation and personal change that was offered. One of those schemes was the Learning Together program run by Cambridge University. On November 29th, 2019, Steve was given the chance to leave prison for the first time to attend a Learning Together event at Fishmongers Hall near London Bridge, his first day of freedom for 14 and a half years. Attending that event were 25-year-old Cambridge graduate Jack Merritt, who'd worked with Steve, Saskia Jones, a 23-year-old volunteer, and Usman Khan, who had been released from jail in 2018, halfway through a 16-year sentence for terrorism offences. During a break in the event, screams were heard, and against the advice of his prison escort, Steve headed downstairs to be confronted by Khan, two eight-inch knives strapped to his hands and wearing what looked to be a suicide vest. On the floor were two women, one of them Saskia Jones. Steve, with the help of two others, John Crilly and Darren Frost, eventually forced Khan out onto London Bridge and pursued him. Armed with a fire extinguisher and bizarrely two huge narwhal tusks that they'd pulled off the wall inside the building, they then cornered Khan, who continued to fight back. Steve wrestled him to the ground as armed police arrived and after telling them that he had a bomb, Khan was shot dead. Saskia Jones very sadly died as a result of her injuries, along with Jack Merritt, who, unbeknown to Steve, had been stabbed and killed earlier in the attack. The reaction to Steve's heroic ac actions by the prison system was not straightforward. We'll talk a bit about that. But he was granted eventually a royal prerogative of mercy and a reduction in his sentence of 10 months. And on September 28th this year, he received the Queen's Gallantry Medal. He now works with newly released prisoners and is a fundraiser at the Howard League for Penal Reform. Steve's new book, The Road to London Bridge, is a compelling account of that terrible day but also of his years spent in the prison system. So this is a conversation about heroism, about terror, about managing crisis and managing guilt. Steve Gallant, welcome to Crisis What Crisis. How are you? I'm great, thank you. It's really great to have you with us, um, and thank you for it. Um, Steve, as will become apparent as we talk through the detail of this story, what you and, of course, others experienced um, and did on that day is... Um, you know, is almost, as I, as I touched on, almost beyond comprehension. Uh, you went to Windsor Castle. You received the Queen's Gallantry Medal for the part that you played. Tell me how receiving that award um, so soon after you uh, left prison um, felt, Steve, surreal, I imagine, in, uh, in some ways. It, it certainly felt special. There's not two ways about that. To, to come from where I've been, taking somebody's life, going on that journey for the prison system 
and seeing and witnessing violence and problems and restrictions and, and stigma attached to, to and you know, in many cases, rightly so, to, to, to prisoners. And then to find myself being awarded such a prestigious medal, you know, an award. Um, yeah, of course, it was special. It was, it was a very powerful moment for me. Did you have your family with you? I invited my partner with me, my dad, and uh, a lawyer who, who supported me all the way. So I had, close, yeah, I had some close friends and family with me. So, Steve, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you the question directly right up front. Now, you are undeniably a hero, right? Well, I mean, I, 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 I wouldn't... Let me finish, let me finish. That's not a question. That's a statement. Okay. You are undeniably a hero. The question, I suppose, is do you feel like one? No, of course not. I mean, what is a hero? I mean, heroes are different things to different people. I, clearly what I did that day was a, a very brave thing. And I, I think it's obviously right that people should be, you know, recognised for those sort of things. So, but, you know, again, going back to my past and, and stuff like that, I knew it was um, going to be a, a, a tricky and difficult thing for, to, for um, officials to sort of do. But they did it. And, and, and I'm pleased with that. I'm pleased they, they found the courage to, to say, you know, what, we're going to recognise you and, and, and take any public flack with that. Can you say you believe that that is a, an important moment in t of change, really, for, for those who argue for rehabilitation, for who argue for the opportunity for people to, to change? I do, because I, 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 I've, said, I've said this before, I think the medal for me doesn't just represent bravery, it represents change, the possibility of change, no matter where you've been in life, you know, no matter what you've done, um, there's always hope, and, and if you if you work hard, you can you can get there. So it represents change for me too, and I, I, I'd, I'd like to see that reflected right across the system, and, and almost in a type of message, you know, to, to all those who are, who are struggling, and, and not just in prison too. You know, everyone faces their own struggles; it's all relative. So there's there's always hope. Steve, let's go back to um, to, to the long long before London Bridge. Um, Tell me a little bit about your. Um, tell me a little bit about your upbringing, um, because it was not straightforward. Uh, you ended up in prison for a very long time. It wasn't your first time in prison. Just give us a. Just give us a feel for your. You know your 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 years as a child, as a teenager. So I was raised in East Hull, initially on on, on a, an estate called Branzone, one of one of Europe's largest. I remember you know, towns were quite tough even as a child, and. Violence was quite, I guess, normal, and you know, kids got hit, and it was quite acceptable at, at that time. And I, I think I was suffering from an attention deficit as a child as well, so I, um, I misbehaved, and I would get a clip for it and stuff like that. And, um, and there was a lot of drugs in my area as well growing up. Um, but I never felt unloved. I always felt loved by my my mother mm -hmm. and my and my father. My father left, however, when I was very very young, although we stayed in touch throughout my childhood, up to a certain point. There was a round and I felt loved. But at some point in my, my life, I think I was about nine years old, another man came into my life who had quite poor problem solving skills himself. So when I messed around, he would use violence. This, is, it, this is a stepfather? This is my stepfather, yeah. And he, and he used violence to, to, to deal with me. But, and this was a, uh, it was a big rugby player and, and his, his violence was consisted of kicks, punch, slaps, and, you know, and, and quite a good, a quite you know a tough good adding you know for for a young kid to 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 sort of experience and I didn't know at the time um, but that was having an impact on me and I was learning how to to resolve issues myself through violence because I didn't know any better I thought it was normal to be hit so I took that out onto the streets and met like-minded kids who were similar to me and, and it just became a normal way of life getting into fights and resolving issues through violence mm -hmm. and and you accumulated. As I understand it, you know, a series of kind of fairly small, minor offences, but it did eventually lead to you being uh, put into put into a sort of young offenders yeah. uh, institution, right? Yes, yeah, so I was given I think eight months, and I'd, again, I spent four four and a half months in prison as a youth. Uh, I did a little bit of time in remand. I spent time at a, a, a school for naughty children. I went to attention dis attention centres, detention centres, all these sort of places where kids go when they're messing around. Um, yeah, and so that impacted my chances of finding employment, joining the army and stuff like that. So it had an impact on me. That was your plan, was it, to join the army? Well, yeah, I mean, a lot of kids in that area did. That's what they did. They'd, they'd apply for the army and go off. But unfortunately, I'd accumulated too many um, uh, offences, and, and uh, so, it, so it 
they just rejected me. And that probably would have been a, a nice route for me to sort of take some of that risk-taking behaviour and, and channel it more uh, constructively. But unfortunately, it never happened. It's interesting. We had Andy McNabb on the podcast. Yeah, I've seen him. Yeah. Who, yeah. as a young lad, yeah, I've got read into it. a lot of trouble. Yeah. And he... He, he was fortunate. He's yeah. very explicit. Army saved his... Yeah. Absolutely yeah. saved his life. I feel that would, have, that would have been the same for me. But, hey, you know, you, you know yeah. that's yeah. how it is. Um, Steve, you set out the events that led um, to your murder conviction. Uh, in, you know, you set them out in full in your book. It is unvarnished. Um, I'm going to summarise very quickly. Mm -hmm. April 2005, as I touched on, you killed Barry Jackson in, a, in an attack outside a pub. You described the violence of, of your attack outside that pub, um, you know, viscerally in the book. As I say, you don't try and paint it for anything but it was, other than what it was. You know, a violent act of revenge that cost someone their life. Just, if you can, Steve, just tell us now from this distance and with everything that has followed that we're going to discuss. When you think about that day, what immediately comes into mind? Or do you just try not to think about that day? Because you've thought about it enough? I've, I've thought about it a lot and I still think about it. And I think you, when you do something like that, you should think about it. You know, there's no hiding from it. I, I believe 100% that nobody has the right to take the law into their own hands and certainly not kill anybody. I mean, look, if, if everyone did that, then society would be a complete mess, wouldn't it? But as I said earlier, those ideas that I was brought up around um, instilled in me this idea that this was the way to deal with that situation using violence. Mm. Um, so I understand that. I understand why I did it. But today, I, I understand completely that violence is completely wrong, and it's why really I'm against violence now. And I, I you know, I, I you want know, to talk about it. I, 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 in society, whether it's where, no matter where it is, across the world, in society, it's a bad thing. It's just a really bad way to resolve issues, and it's, I think things can be much better resolved by, through communication and stuff like that. Of course, at that time. Um, you know, we did call the police. Um, they'd not arrested him, even though they knew who he was. Um, after the attack against your girlfriend. This, yeah, this is after the attack on my, my girlfriend. Yeah, and he wasn't. I mean, there's, you know, the, the, I, quote, I quoted what the superintendent said in the press about the the chap who who I, whose life I'd taken. That he was a bad, extremely violent and dangerous man. They knew what he was like. And yet, for some reason, they'd not arrested him. But that still doesn't justify what I did. I could have made a decision at that point to walk away that night when I knew that he was in the pub. I could have walked away. Of course, I could have done. Um, but for the circumstances which I, I explain in my book, I didn't make that decision. You repeat the words of the judge, actually. Yeah. Um, who said in your sentencing, saint or sinner, everyone has the right not to be killed in the way that that man was killed that yeah. night. Yeah. It's interesting to me that you chose to include those words in the book. Because it, I think it was really important that I did, because I had to close that element, that chapter, because, you know, I was resisting uh, I didn't want to go to prison of course you know I knew I'd taken somebody's life and I was trying to minimize the impact self-preservation is a very powerful thing by the way mm -hmm. you know when you're facing a sentence of life potentially spend the rest of your life in prison you could die in prison it's not normal to go yeah yeah just you know, just throw me in there you know do what you want to me so of course I wanted to minimize the impact of that it was my belief that Barry uh, had attacked my partner but it wasn't proven in the court of law so it was it was my allegation that's important to yeah. clarify yeah and I thought you know what I have to I have to what is my real thought in this how can I how can I close this element properly and those those, those remarks from the judge I think were were, were very important to recognize and accept nobody has the right to die mm. in that in that manner yeah so that's why that's why I put it in there can I ask about um, the day of your um, your conviction your sentencing yeah. really. the first day of what you knew would be a very very long sentence Obviously, you'd been on remand. You'd, you know, you'd been in prison for a while then. But that first night back in the cell, knowing you're convicted, what do you remember of that night? It was almost, was, oddly enough, there was almost a sense of relief. I felt that going through that trial, I was, I was completely shattered. You know, focusing on all the all the work I'd done to to, to try and sort of negate the impact of, of what was about to happen. But I was almost relieved that at least the trial was open because. Like I say in the book, it's like it's like a window into your soul. Everything about it is exposed. You know, your, your conversations, there's loads of evidence there and you don't, there's nothing you can do about it and everyone's looking at it and analysing it, it's in the press. 
and it's just a horrible thing to go through, Andy, and you, 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 you've experienced it yourself. Total lack of control. Total lack of control. It is horrible. So in one sense, I was relieved that that part of my life was over. Of course, I still had this, this sentence. I would have gone to prison anyway because I would have upset to the manslaughter at the very least. There was always going to be a prison sentence. So, again, it was just about processing that and just a sense of relief, but thinking, well, you know what? You are where you are. You, you can potentially look at appealing, you know, there's some hope there, but it is what it is. You have taken someone's life. Just, just, just get on with it for now because you can't remove yourself from that situation. So I just... I was quite accepting as well of, of my accepting situation. Accepting quite quickly as well. From what from from reading the book, you seem to get to that point pretty quickly. Still. It was within the 12 months after that that I think I came to that point, and one of the key reasons was because when I committed that offence alongside my co-defendant, prior to that I had these ideas that it was, you know, you don't grass your mates up, you stick by your mates at all costs, and I those values were quite, quite deeply embedded in me. So when I was arrested... Sorry, before I was arrested and I was on the run, I, once I heard that my co-defendant had been arrested, I said, I'm gonna, I didn't even hesitate. I said, right, I'm going to ram myself in. I'll take it on my toes. So I did that. And then a short while later, I had realised that those people who I'd stuck by all my life and, and backed up were not quite what I thought they were. And some of them turned against me to, to cover their own asses and stuff like that. And I realised that from that experience, I've been living a lie. And while I'd prioritised my family, uh, my friends, while, while I'd prioritised my friends over the years, there was nowhere to be seen, yet my family were there, you know? Um, so it was a big slap in the face to me and a big wake-up call. And my partner too was, you know, despite me going out on endless nights with my friends and leaving her at home or whatever, you know, she was still there, stood at the end, you know? and. I, I realise I've made a big, profound mistake in my life. So, for that reason, and for, for and also for losing my partner as well, which she left in the end, and rightly so, because you can't expect someone to hang around for, for 17 years or, or longer. Um, I thought, yeah, I've messed up here. All the things that I, I should have loved and respected have gone, and now what have I got? And the people who I, who I loved and respected are, um, you know, are nowhere to be seen. So, I, yeah, I, I made a decision at that point that... Well, in fact, what I did was I, I looked at... What was it that got me into this position in the first place? It was my ease, my, I guess my um, decision to use violence to resolve issues was a key part of that. So, and I thought, well, if I want to get through this in one piece, I need to reject that, I need to get rid of violence. So I made a vow quite early on. This was shortly after my partner left, to not use violence again. I mean, the conclusions that you've just described um, that, that you know that you reached could very easily have taken you to a much darker place. Yeah, they could have taken you to despair. They could have taken you to 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 to, to the feeling that this is there's nowhere to go. Yeah, to to a sort of total absence of hope uh, and an inability to move forward, which happens to an awful lot of people in prison. What is it that got you then? So so we understand the background. The backstory. What put me there? Well, no, well, no. Well, we understand yeah. the backstory that 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 kind of uh, arguably put you there. Mm. What we don't know is the backstory that allowed you to what see, seems like a sort of flipping of a switch. Uh, this yeah. vow, this vow, never to be involved in violence again, and this vow of self improvement, right? Which is which you demonstrate throughout the you know the rest of the time in your prison, which we'll talk mm. about briefly. What is mm. it about you, Steve, and and your because we're always interested in this question yeah. in, 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 on this podcast. How, what, what, what is it that, that kind of created that ability within you? Well, it, it confused me at first because how had I made this profound dis mistake and got myself into this situation where I, I jumped over a cliff edge and like, regretted it you know, seconds later. It was too late. But then suddenly realised that what I did was so wrong that I could change my mind and never commit violence again. So I, I went off to analyse that because I understood that I'd done it and I'd got myself in that position and made this decision, but I didn't quite understand how and why. So my journey was understanding that. But looking back now, you're right, a lot of people don't make that decision. So um, what led you to? What, but what, I what, did. When you look back at your life now, what do you think? I think that, some, that, of the, come from? I think that some of those tougher elements of my, of my life, although they sent me in the wrong direction, I think they also created a bit of resilience within me to help me overcome these types of challenges. And 
going back a little bit further, I had a, a, a brilliant woman in my life who was my grandmother, and she used to take me on um, journeys and challenges and, and stuff like that to the countryside and to and to the late district. And I, when I look back at that, you know, she never said it, but the experiences themselves, I think she was instilling in me and my my, my other siblings uh, this idea that you know life's tough and you've got lots of challenges and to get through them sometimes you have to make tough decisions and persevere so i i think some of that definitely played a role in why i decided at that point to look at this this huge mountain in front of me i think you know what i can get through this on one level this is a ridiculous question uh given the length of time involved but steve tell me about your time in prison so yeah what was that like it was very very challenging very challenging I, when I first went to prison, I think resources were okay. Um, you know, prisons weren't great, but compared to what they are now, it was okay. And when I went off to Franklin, although initially that was fine, we, there was some issues there in terms of violence, which which happened for a certain reason. Gatcha prison again, when I got there, hit a, a cat B was was well, you know, well resourced, very settled. Um, but during that period uh, that I was in prison, yeah, so a gang war broke out. In Franklin, and I also saw. I was also in HMP Gartry when uh, there was a, a, a project uh, implemented called benchmarking, which saw a, a massive reduction in staff over that period that I was in Gartry. And once that happened, um, it was filled by you know um, extremists and, and gang members, and, and violence then picked up again and really impacted the environment. So I witnessed that and went through all that, and. Yeah, it was a very, very tough time for me because I'd, I'd rejected violence myself. I didn't want nothing more to do with it, and I saw how bad it was, and yet I was witnessing around me violence and problems and all these things that brought me to prison were just everywhere. And it just really sort of gave me a, a, a completely different perspective of, of this thing. So, some, of these, some of these are moments, you describe it all in the book, some of these are moments that just sort of explode in your yeah. environment, right? Uh, some of it is confrontation directly... Yeah at mm. you that you step back from and yeah. avoid. Mm. Uh, there are other instances where things are brewing, obviously the gang culture yeah. in, 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 in prison, the, the kind of invitation to be part of one group or another mm. that comes with protection. Uh, you somehow navigated yeah. your way through all of this. I did, and, and that's because of that that vow I made to, use, to, to not use violence and to educate myself as well, you know, part of the part of my commitment was to, to, to learn, learn about myself, learn about my own psychology, educate myself and grow. And I, I started to find enjoyment in that and in reward. So while this stuff was going on around me, I had this private space and this private sort of objective, which I had going on. You had a strategy. I had a strategy, yeah. And a mindset as well. And a strategy that you knew you'd have to stay true to yeah. for the thick end of 17 years. Yes, that's right. And it wasn't easy, by the way. It was very, very challenging at times. Very challenging because it's, it's, it's persistent it's almost every day you know okay so yeah. we took you know for people who are listening to this uh, who, uh, who are involved in strategy in a very different way because <laughs> we've all got them in our lives right how did you stay true to it then what, what's the voice in the head what were you saying to yourself I, I just i just stuck to that vow i just said to myself you'll get through this you'll get to the end i knew that if i'd have responded with violence it would have been a huge step back for me because I was in prison for committing a serious crime. So for me to engage in violence, it would have been just a, a, a really black cloud hanging over me and, and it would have in, um, impacted my ability to move forward. So what happened when I, when I was in Franklin and I steered through all that mess, when I got to the end of it and I realised I was moving on, I was reaping the benefits, I was reaping the rewards of that. So I thought, you know what, this is this is benefiting me, you know, this, this you know, resisting violence, resisting uh, responding to, to people and, and, and educating myself and doing the right thing. It was, I was seeing the benefits of that. So I was able to, you know, to, to, to hold on to something to get me through that, that, that phase and then get to the next stage. Because I guess, you, you know, you do, you do a sentence like that in stage, you think, right, I've got a cat here prison to get through here. I'll do what I need to do here. Then I'll get to the next prison. So yeah. you break it down. Yeah. That's what I did so the, si the system does set targets effectively, doesn't it? Right, there are there are kind of you know doors that you can keep walking through if yeah. you tick the boxes, do the yeah. work, kind of you know s s stay on track. You were clearly were very focused on that as well. Um, Steve, could I ask you during your stay in prison, the numbers of convictions for terrorism offences you know dramatically increased. Yeah, um, you write about um, how that impacted the culture of prison, mm -hmm. those gangs that were created. Mm -hmm. 
um, uh, the, the, the kind of growth of extremism within the prison system. Given what we're going to talk about later, just give me your view on, 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 on that, how you saw that kind of develop, grow, turn into something that was dangerous then and still dangerous now. It was clear to me when certain individuals convicted of terrorist-related offences were coming into the system and I was hearing the voices and the concerns and the prejudice and some of it racism from some of the prisoners, predominantly white prisoners who were already in Franklin and what they were going to do and, and how that manifested into violence um, against... Um, initially against those convicted of terrorist-related offences, but more started to filter into the system and the balance of power started to change and they started to retaliate. And you could see it, it really created a lot of fear within, within, within the prison. Underlying that, it was obvious that this wasn't only a problem for prison environments and for prisons trying to rehabilitate people. It could potentially flare up into a problem for society because you had people who initially might have been doing it out of fear or whatever, conveying to the Muslim faith and joining these gangs. But where, was they, where were they going to end up? Because, you know, when these, these are, are chaps sometimes who are easily led, um, have got no solid grounding in life, and you could see that some of them were really getting into it and, you know, getting into the certain types of literature and God knows what else and, and, and engaging in violence. And I thought, well, if you're engaging violence now against prisoners, what are you going to do when you get out? Look, Steve, you had a long, hard stare at that as compared to my glimpse. My yeah, yours was quite a soft, uh, soft landing. But, I mean, it's still terrible, you know, it's all relative, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure I'd describe Belmarsh as a soft landing, but um, I'll take, oh, your, point. You I'll take, I'll take yeah. your point. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and I thought you I thought, I thought you was looking and went straight to the open, open prison. You know but on this point, on this, okay. on this, on this point... Uh, uh, it seemed to me that there was just a sensitivity around it, right? The system didn't really want to address it. Yeah, timidity. I think that's changed, I think, now. I certainly read that it's changed. I hope that it's changed. Oh, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm so far away from there now, but yeah. um, certainly at the time. The reason why I'm sceptical is because it, it, it should have changed from Franklin, but then I saw it follow me into Gartry, so, and it still hadn't changed. It was getting worse. Uh, but, you know... <laughs> For staff, it was difficult because they had been reducing numbers, so they was they was facing all sorts of challenges anyway. Yeah. But yeah, I was it was it, it would be concerning to anyone that the lack of yeah. um, efforts to contain what was growing. Yeah. This is an important part of the conversation because obviously what we're going to get to. Yeah, yeah. And there is a there is one might argue a link. You, I'm interested to ask you whether you think whether you think that there is. Um, so let's 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 okay. discuss um, November 29th, 2019, uh, Steve. Um, you came out of prison that morning, the first time that you'd come out of prison for uh, 14 and a half years. Travelled into London with your escort, Adam. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, uh, tell me about that, just that journey, first of all. Um, yeah, well, you couldn't imagine where I've been all those years. But I was in an open prison at the time, HMP Spring Hill. But it, HMP Spring Hill, it's full of sort of like chalets, and they're not very clean. There's 20 man to each, each chalet, there's two showers, and you can imagine it's dirt and grime up the walls. It's horrendous. And then to go to London that day, and you know, the sun was shining, um, I just felt this sense of freedom uh, and just opportunity. And I knew I was going to a nice place because, you know, who was going to be there? And, you know, imagine Fishmongers Hall, it's a beautiful building. And when I I noticed the contrast between the wash facilities in the prison and in Fishmongers Hall. You know, there was in Fishmongers Hall, it was sparkling and beautiful, but yet the prison's just horrendous. Mm. The contrast was just amazing. But I just said to myself, just enjoy your day. You know, don't get too excited because, um, you know, you stay focused. There's still a long way to go. Yeah, it's a long way to go here. So I did. You spent some time that day with Jack Merritt, mm -hmm. who you knew already, yep. because Jack was part of the scheme yep. that you'd uh, that you'd been involved in for quite some time here. So you knew Jack. You knew Jack reasonably well. I did. I'd, I'd known Jack for just over two years, maybe two and a half years. Um, I'd met him first when he came into HMP Warren Hill with the Learn Together team. And Saskia? Had you I met, didn't know had you Saskia Jones, no. I didn't no. Know. I'd seen her flitting about, but I didn't know her personally. Yeah. Um, Usman Khan, you didn't know? I didn't know. But you heard him speak that morning, is that right? Yes. Um, what did he say? There was a, a lady... Uh, doing a talk on, I think it was to do with ideas and how 
or, or things that people say in life when you're young can affect you later on in life. So that's say you call a kid stupid or something and they might grow up thinking they're stupid or it might just affect him in some way. And I, and I think it was talking about ideas. And if I recall rightly, Usman said something like, and he contributed, you know, he contributed to this, this session. And he said something like, um, yeah, I had friends who were thinking in a certain way and I told them that they were wrong to think that way. And I thought, okay, maybe, you know, maybe he was an ex-gang member or something like that, you know, a prisoner, and, and he had some friends who were quite antisocial, and now he'd changed his perspective and he was telling them that they're wrong. So I, I had quite a positive view of what he'd said. And then there's a, um, and then there's a break in the day. Mm -hmm. um, you're upstairs, um, uh, and uh, you hear some screaming from downstairs. Mm -hmm. uh, just talk me through, Steve, what happened, what happened next. So on hearing the screaming, I was reluctant to go and investigate because I was told to stay there by Adam, my escorting officer. But they continued, and Amy Ludlow came rushing into the room, and she said, everybody stay there. It's Usman, she said, and started pressing the numbers on her phone. And so I, I made the assumption that these screams were obviously related to this chap called Usman, and he was potentially responsible. So I just thought, sod this. I just jumped up, made my way to the door really quickly, went down the stairs, and immediately I saw who I now know is Saskia Jones, laid on the, at the bottom of the stairs, lots of blood coming from her neck. And the officer who was with me had his hand on her neck, trying to stem the flow of blood. Another lady was laid on the floor in a fetal position, lots of blood underneath her, not moving. And then I saw ahead of me, Usman Khan. I'm gonna stop you just very mm. quickly. Um, Steve, you're on the first day of release after a decade and a half in, a decade and a half in prison. Not one act of violence during that time. As you say, prison escort had discouraged you from getting involved. But you say to yourself, um, sod it. Yeah. I'm getting involved. Yeah. Just try and explain to me what led you to having years, a decade and a half of avoiding in prison those moments of mm. random violence, of, 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 of this uh, repeated incidents exploding mm. around you and being able to resist. What caused you in that moment to say, no, this is different? Somebody was in danger. You know, I heard a girl's voice, you know, a girl's scream. So for me, that was it. Somebody was in danger. I was surrounded by academics. I know what my physical abilities are. You know, I've been training for years in prison anyway. I've been doing boxing, jiu-jitsu. Even though I've not been involved in violence, I was keeping myself physically fit. Right. So, so I was probably at my peak mental and physical fitness. So I guess with that in mind, and knowing someone was potentially in danger, I thought I would take the risk and go and investigate. I, I, I knew Amy, Amy Ludlow anyway. I knew Amy, and I know she's a sensible lady, and, and I know when she came rushing into that room as well, I knew something was... Properly wrong. Properly wrong, yeah. So... That's why, I mean, that and other factors maybe made that decision to go sod it and go and investigate. So let's pick it up. You're at the bottom of the stairs. Khan is in front of you. You are able to see immediately that he's got these knives mm -hmm. strapped to his wrists. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, a, 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 what appears to be a suicide vest, a, yes. a, a vest with ex explosives. Yeah. Just tell us what happens next. What happened next? Well, I'd seen Usman, oh, I now know to be Usman, and I just thought to myself, well, you're clearly responsible for this. I immediately knew that this was probably a terrorist attack. It just seemed so obvious, given um, the situation, the look, everything about it. And I, did, I, didn't, I generally didn't hesitate. I didn't really think about the consequences on me. I just felt, I think, underlying all of what I'd been through, all the violence I'd seen, my own violence, everything, I was so fed up of seeing it, you know, and then on my first day out of prison, I've seen this atrocious act of violence. And for me, it was just this almost... <laughs> I mean, it's weird because I say, you, you, everything happens so quickly. And when I say I didn't think about it, I, I probably did, but subconsciously. So for me, it was just natural just to, just to, just to deal with it, just to take it on, you know? And, and it felt to me like it was just a natural thing for me just to, to engage into. I do, didn't do you remember feeling any one, fear? No, I didn't feel... No, not at all. Just not, adrenaline not one, not one took little, over? Adrenaline took over, um, but I didn't, I didn't... I wasn't aware of my adrenaline either. I was just... 
focus single-mindedly on making sure that this bank cadet no more, no one else. Of course, I you know I, I I kept my distance. I did things right. I know what my physical abilities are. I wasn't stupid to just run at him and grab him. You know, I I initially what I did was I saw a piece of wood on the floor, and I thought there's still people. You know, they're they're in danger. They need you know medical assistance fast. There's also people hid. There's also people upstairs, and at risk to this guy as well. So whatever I need to do, it had to, it had to be done fast anyway, expediently. So my aim was just to have it, you know. Um, keep him occupied until the police arrive or take him to the ground. Mm -hmm. So I just stopped. There's a big chunk of wood next to me on the floor, um, probably from the previous skirmish. So I picked it up and just launched it at his head and it just missed and hit this big curtain behind him. And then he came towards me and opened up his jacket to show me his explosive vest. What did he, what did he say, Steve? He didn't say anything at that point. He just showed me his vest and probably trying to scare me off. But I, I wasn't... I wasn't phased by it. I just told myself it's probably fake. I didn't know that at the time, of course. But I guess I would, my, that's my psychology, just trying to deal with it. You know, and Darren parents. and John are now uh, uh, on the scene. Darren had taken the, uh, bizarrely, these huge narwhal mm. tusks that were effectively kind of ornaments on a wall. Yeah. He'd taken one of those, mm. and you grabbed that and and well, no, uh, so jabbed I, or threw that well, at, at Usman? After I'd thrown this, this piece of wood at Usman and he'd shown me, he'd shown me the bomb, I was then stood there unarmed and Usman was there and then I just turned and then, oh, I now know is Darren Frost was stood next to me holding out the Norwell tusk. So I just took it. I didn't think nothing of it. I just took it. I thought, well, this seems like an, an ideal type of weapon to sort of use to sort of keep him at bay and, and whatnot. So I just took it and then went into... Like, it was in like an, a foyer area. It's quite a tight space. But I just went into the doorway and then I just took him on. I just, we just engaged into this, you know, he sees, he's seeing me coming now, he's swinging his knives. We're going backwards and forwards, keeping, and just keeping a distance from him. And I managed to stab him with the Norwell tusk and hit him in the chest. But it seemed to bounce off and it seemed to take the blows really, really well, which made me think, hang on a minute, is this guy, is he taking something or, or what? But, um, but I continued and he come back at me again and then I managed to hit him with the Norwell tusk and snap it across his shoulder. But then I was unarmed again, so he ran, ran towards me. I backed off again. And then he stopped. He sort of went back into the foyer. And I just told myself, just get back in there. What's the matter with you? So I went back in. I picked up a chair and then managed to smash that over him. And then after a while, um, he turned around and said, I'm waiting for the police, I'm waiting for the police. And then came towards me, I moved away and he shut the door. Obviously, he was starting to feel the heat. Um, but for me, I thought, well, let's not give him no thinking time. So I... By then, he's managed to make his way back over so to the just, front. Again, if we can just pause for a second. Yep. There's two opportunities for you to perfectly reasonably step away, mm. right? But you choose to just keep going back in. Yeah, I mean, it probably seems, you know, like, um, that I enjoy violence. Um, no, it uh, doesn't. I'm not suggesting that. No, no, I'm not saying to you, but I'm not, I'm not to anyone who might be sort of contemplating that because um, there I am really sort of pushing it and getting onto this guy and, and using violence against him. But it, it was for that simple reason, was to keep him occupied or take him down because other people were still vulnerable. So, yeah, I could have backed off, but there was a point at which he then raced out of the building and onto London Bridge, and someone shut the door behind him. The door to the fishmongers hall, it, it locks automatically, so it, it, people can't get back in if they walk out. And I remember saying, to, to, there's people out there, you know, no, there's people out there on London Bridge, I haven't a clue watch is about to hit them so i just said to this kid move i'm going out after him so i went out and then i as i got to the top of the stairs i seen us walking towards london bridge and i see a, a, a number of office a ladies wearing office clothing walking towards just him. remind ourselves what time of day this is two o'clock in the afternoon yeah, yeah. two o'clock in the afternoon very busy so people probably get heading back to the office after yeah lunch, the, yeah day. yeah it's just busy you know traffic uh, almost to a standstill um his ladies, I see these ladies walking towards him, completely oblivious. I just, I thought, Mr. Lamb, so I shouted, get back, it's a terrorist. Get back, it's a terrorist. And at that point, I even thought, this is, this is crazy. You know, what's going on? Have I lost my mind or something? But I, I had to stay the course, you know. And John and Darren have gone with you, right? No, John and Darren were still inside. Right. They were still inside. And husband. Now, it's at this point that um, I go blank, by the way. Um, it was, I only know what happened because when I went to the inquest, the the the, the, um, the chap who was there dealing with the case told me what happened. And a lot of it is on film. Yes, not inside. There was no cameras inside at the time, no. so that's not on film. But 
there is a point... But outside on the bridge. Outside on the bridge, but there's a point where... I, I I go out and Usman must have been irritated by me and he's come back up the stairs. I don't remember this. He ran towards me and apparently he's right next to me. I've backed off back into the building because I'm unarmed and I've shut the door. He can't, back, he can't get back in. I've then gone and picked up another Norwell tusk and then gone back out. He's gone back down on the bridge and I've gone out after him and then he's turned to face me again outside. We've had another altercation outside where I, I, I whack him. He managed to get the Norwell tusk off me and then throw it back at me somehow. But I don't remember this. I don't remember really? at all. Yes, and I think that was just... That's, that's, that bit it, of it is a complete blank. Well, you can imagine, this is my first out of prison in 14 and a half years. This is my first second of actually being in the fresh air without no one escorting me, because he's in there, and I'm actually chasing a terrorist out onto London Bridge. So it must have been some sort of information overload. I, you know, God knows, but... It's I, an information I, overload listening to it. Yeah. God only knows and it's actually living it. And it's only when I feel a cold spray hit my arm that my memory comes back, and that was John Crilly coming out with the fire extinguisher. He sprays Usman from the top of the stairs and catches me on the arm, and it's from there that my memory comes back. So pick it up from there. So then Darren comes out with, with, the, with another Norway tusk, and Usman then turns and runs off towards London Bridge. Them two then chase Usman Khan, and I follow, I follow suit. And then, you know, the, the other thing that was strange about that day as well, the, the sun was quite low. This is a November and it was shining across London Bridge, so that it created a really sur surreal atmosphere. It mm. felt odd. Mm. But I just, I knew I had to just somehow stop this guy. <laughs> and as I reached him, I just remember saying to myself, what, what am I messing about for? Why keep, just, just, just grab him or something, just take him to the ground, you know? That's what I told myself. And I just remember just reaching for him with my two hands and just bringing him down to the ground. And then I just said to the other two, grab his hands, grab his hands. And then Darren jumped in and things went on from there. We know he's got this suicide vest on yeah. at this stage. Mm -hmm. And this is, you know, again, just gets to the kind of extreme bravery of this situation for you and for, and for Darren mm -hmm. and, for, and for John. Yeah. You all knew that he had this mm -hmm. vest on. You didn't know that it was fake, no. which is what it turned out to have been. Yeah. Uh, uh, what, what's in the... Uh, I, I, get, I get the adrenaline, I get the drive to protect, but you know he could have, he could have triggered that at any second, had it, yeah. had it been a... Had it, your, yeah. All your instincts were, this is fake, or all your instincts were, it doesn't really matter, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, to... I just got to Well, I made it. that assessment that it was fake anyway, so I just stuck to that and didn't think nothing more of it. I'd just gone on with the job, and I, I, I maybe in my mind I thought that if you're going to press it, he would have done it by now when I was whacking him with a Norwell tusk, um, because if there's anyone to take out, it would have been me. Um, so I didn't really think about it. I, he, he had two knives still strapped to his hands. They were strapped by tape, these two six-inch mm -hmm. knives. Mm -hmm. And I, don't, I, don't, I, don't ha I didn't have a clear view of his hands, but I felt confident when I was on top of him because I've you know, I'd been wrestling for years as well. So my hold and my grip is really good. I understand people's body movement and, 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 and stuff like that. So I'm really in tune with people when I've got Mm. hold of him and I felt quite safe in terms of how I had hold of him and then Darren come in and grabbed his hands too um were you able to get the knives off I didn't do that and I sort of kept hold of him right because I thought I'll just keep her a sort of I was in a good position I knew he couldn't just lash out with the knives so I'm quite quick anyway in, in terms of my responses I felt reasonably comfortable with how I had things but somehow he managed to get back to his feet I don't know how he did that but he did and there was a few of us on him at the time I remember he had a really strong, solid base. Mm. He wasn't quick on his feet, but he was solid, very hard to move. Mm. And then a little gap opened up where I had a really a clear view of his face, and that's when I, I gave him a couple of uppercuts to the jaw, and then he dropped back down again. Everyone lands on top of him. And um, it's during that point as well that someone actually ran up and said, give him a kick in. You know, some, some was, was For actually, out someone out of the hall or someone it was, it was somebody who'd been, it was somebody it was a, a, an ex-offender actually who had been in prison and was at the event that day right he knew some of the people some of the ladies quite well who'd, who'd been injured right and I seen him running up out of frustration he went give him a kick in and I shouted no don't hit him and stopped any sort of violence towards him um, tell me that thought process um, explain that thought process well it, 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 I did that because it wasn't about the violence. It wasn't about giving him a kick. And I could have, at that point, and this is what I said to the pro board, you know, 
when I was being uh, told I was being violent by probation, that I'd be violent towards the, the terrorist offender. You know, I explained that at that point, you know, I, I had the power to either get stuck into it myself. Nobody would have said anything. I could have given him a few, a few more boats and I could have got away with it. Or I could have stepped back and let everyone give him a kick in, you know, but I didn't because it wasn't about violence. It was about controlling the situation. We had control at that point, so there's no need for it. The police arrive, mm -hmm. armed police. Um, just pick up what happens once they arrive. You see the police get out of their uh, get out of their vehicle. It's clear that they've got guns. It's pretty clear what might well happen next. But you don't, as a group, you don't immediately withdraw, do you? No, I mean. It, it, I think it was important to still control them until people peeled away because you can't just let go and move back when everyone's around. It's just a mess. So um, when the police came, I knew straight away, I, I just knew, I thought, he's finished, he's finished. So I just thought, I'll just keep hold of him here until people move away and there's enough space for us to peel off. So as that started to happen and people moved away, I, I knew when my time was ready to move away. So As I understand it, he said uh, to the police, I've got a bomb. I never heard that. Apparently, Darren's um, account. Darren yeah. had heard him say yeah. that I've got a bomb. It doesn't surprise me because I, I think that husband went there that day to die, so it, it would make sense for him to say something like that. Yeah. Uh, you watched the policeman shoot him. When I got off and moved away, I, I tried to tug at Darren because he was still clinging on to him, but he wouldn't budge. So I thought, well, um, that's your choice, mate. You know, I'm trying to move here. If you want to stay, that's fine. Because it was obvious that once these bullets start flying one of them could hit you so but I tried to pull Darren wouldn't let go and I thought I've done my bit there's nothing more I can do I'll leave the police to deal with it now so I peeled away and by the time I turned to, to look back I did a couple of shots I think it was two shots I'm not certain Darren was no longer on him the police had pulled him off and then Usman somehow managed to try and get back to his feet again he tried to get up which again surprised me he'd been having been shot he'd been shot he'd been shot at that point, yeah, twice. He tried to get up and then he was shot again and tasered uh, in the head, I think it was, and I saw him drop back down again. Um, you go back into Fishmonger's hall. Mm -hmm. um, you discover, obviously, that one of those two ladies that you saw uh, at the bottom of the stairs, that one of them is, is dead, mm -hmm. um, Saskia. Yeah. As I understand it, you did not know at that stage, that uh, much earlier in the attack, before you'd come down the stairs, that Jack had been killed. Um, in fact, I don't think you discovered that until later that day. Or no, I, I didn't even know I'd been attacked at that point, but I, I, I made the assumption that something had happened when I went looking for him and I said, where's Jack, you know, and people couldn't speak, they couldn't describe what happened, and I thought, well, maybe he's been caught up, and then I realised that he had been attacked at some point, the extent to which I didn't know. This is someone that you'd known, someone yeah. who'd, who'd been... You know, you'd work quite closely with who had, you know, in in a prison of all places where you'd kind of bonded, uh, yeah. built a relationship. Yeah, I, I never knew Jack in his in his uh, private life, but in his professional life, I got to know him, and he was a decent kid, and he was passionate about what he was doing, and he had a, an amazing ability to make even the most sort of lowly, downtrodden person feel a sense of self worth. He was really good like that, um, but that was his passion. So to hear that. The next day, he'd been killed by somebody who, um, by a person who who was seeking and, and was receiving Jack's help, was yeah. It was a very it was a very powerful moment to hear that, and very sad, because I knew what Jack was like. I knew what sort of work he was doing, and that was gone forever. So it was very powerful, very powerful moment. Um, so you're on day release from prison. You're taken back to prison. Mm -hmm. This unbelievable kind of traumatic event that's happened, and you're <clears throat> back on the train, back to Spring Hill. Mm -hmm. well, actually, I got I got returned to Spring Hill by counterterrorism. Right. So that's from the, so the police the, pol the police took yeah. you from fin Fishmongers Hall back. To yeah, prison. they took me back. Yeah, they took me back to prison. Um, tell me what sort of. Reception is the wrong, wrong word, I know, but tell me what sort of reception you got back at prison initially. Well, I knew... Th actually, I was hoping that people wouldn't know, but by the time I got back, it was obvious that everybody knew, yeah? Um, you know what it's like in, in, in prisons, and everyone was talking about it. But I just thought, you know what, I just... They said to me, look, just 
stay in your cell, just just relax, just, you know, process what's happened. So I did. I thought, I'm not going to come out. A friend of mine went and got some food for me because I thought, I don't want to go to the dinner hall. Everyone's there and, you know, it's just a bit too much for me. So I just stayed in my cell. A few friends came back the next by the next morning. Uh, what's happened? What's happened? You know, and, you know, obviously I spoke to people. You skipped, you skipped through that night. I mean, that night must have... Oh, it was... It was I had to got no sleep. But, yeah, there's, like, a lot of images flashing through my mind and lots of stuff, you know. But I knew that was just part of the process, you know, and what had just happened. I was coming down from a massive boost of adrenaline as well. So it was just a case of just letting that happen, just get through that. You're going to be tired, you're going to be withdrawn, there's going to be a lot of people around you. So just allowing that to, to happen and just... Because I think if you fight it or resist it, there's no point. Just let it happen, and that's what I did. Um, what happens in the sort of days and weeks that, that 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 follow? There is it's not actually known publicly. Your, your certainly your name and your history is not known immediately. No. That does follow later. Um, obviously, you're thinking, how is this going to affect me? You still got, uh, as you've explained, a way to run on your sentence. How is this going to affect it, either positively or negatively? I hinted at it in the introduction. The system's reaction was not necessarily straightforward, was it? In fact, some of it was quite yeah. negative. This question that through these extreme acts of bravery, you had somehow, for some people, shown yourself actually still capable of violence. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, everything seemed OK at first, but that's because my name wasn't in the press. And I was quite happy with that, but... It'd been circling on social media. I think the BBC had been con in contact with Cal Turner, MP from East Hull, so, and they was going to looking to run something. So it was going to come out at some point. And it, during that period, some, uh, a lawyer from Hull came to see me called Neil Hudgel. And uh, Neil said to me, look, you know, we can, you can wait for... Um, we, can, we can wait for your name to come out in the press and then we can respond if you want. And he gave me options. Or we can be proactive and, and try and control the narrative a little bit because we both knew that... Um, my previous offence had the uh, potential to, to 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 sort of um, muddy things a little bit. So we drafted a statement, and in the end, we chose to be proactive, so we could, like I say, control that narrative a little bit. And I wasn't breaking any rules at the time. I informed the governor that I wanted to do that. She, you know, she said, "Prefer not to," but she said, "I can't stop you." But I did it anyway. I released a, a press statement. And it was received pretty good from the press, you know, well received, I felt. But suddenly my name was out there in the public domain as this person who'd not and only... You wanted to do that because you wanted to confront the truth of your history, but do it in a way that was accurate and yeah. that was, yeah. you know, with a degree of control. That yeah, was the motivation. That, that's right, yeah. Well, it was going to come out anyway. Mm. It was going to come out. It's inevitable it was going to come mm. out. So well, let's, let's control it. But some senior managers in the prison didn't like the idea that I'd, I'd done this press release and I was in thrown in handcuffs and taken to the prison next door, which is a cat beer prison, a closed prison, and left there um, to, to, to think about this, this um, rule so, I broke. So after everything that had happened, mm. let's just be clear, um, you are uh, uh, punished and being taken out of an open prison and thrown into a cat bee mm -hmm. is a... Is a, is a proper punishment because you're back in closed conditions yeah, pick back the with full step. regime and you're obviously thinking to now that towards the end of your sentence what on earth is this going to what on earth is this going to mean because it's by no means certain that you would be allowed out at the end of your sentence anyway right no that was not a guarantee no and now you're thinking hang on this m m extraordinary moment that has occurred this event that's occurred could send my life backwards yeah, yeah, I felt I'd done something positive and yet I was being potentially, potentially punished for it. I don't think the prison would necessarily try to punish me. I think it's more of a risk management thing. That's what they explained it. But still, it was, wasn't very well thought through, particularly given I realised at that time I was probably suffering from um, trauma due to that, that event, which I wasn't aware of at the time. But once I stepped back into that closed prison, it just came over me like a dark cloud. Right. And when I was in that prison, I did have suicidal thoughts and I've never had them before I was thinking to myself you know is it is it do I have to end it is that was that the answer to this and that's just not me I'm a strong person I'm a really you've strong never person. had those thoughts never never your entire like sentence ever no and I wouldn't do it 
I'm, I, I just wouldn't, I, you know, I ain't got it in me to do that sort of thing. And I always think that, you know, good days always come. But I had these thoughts, these thoughts flashed my mind. But thankfully, um, Neil Hudgel and, 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 and had spoken to Kyle Turner, MP from East Dublin. The next day, Kyle Turner stood up in Parliament and uh, said to Prime Minister Boris Johnson, uh, you know, in 2005, Steve did a terrible thing, but on the 29th of November 2019, he took a knife-wielding terrorist to the ground. Will you congratulate and, and recognise Steve Gallant? And Boris Johnson stood up and said, yeah, I have deep admiration for Steve Gallant and indeed of us who, 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 who stepped in that day. Almost immediately, the governor of the prison come running across the Cat B, <laughs> took me out and put me back into the open prison and back into my own cell. So it had a, it had a, yeah, a, a very positive outcome, did what Cal did, so I'm, I'm obviously very grateful for what he did there. Um, so now I'm back in the open prison and I, and I, and I was planning on going to, uh, to university as well, in Oxford as well, so I, all that sort of um, came back into the fold and I was able to start going back out uh, start getting back out into the community for the first time properly and attending university. So at that point, things started to, to, to brighten up again. So the, what, the track you were on, you got back on? I got back on that yeah. track, yeah. I got right. back on that track, because I was on that track. I was going to go to the university anyway to study and transfer my my uni of university business degree over to a, an Oxford Brooks one. So that, yeah, I got back on that, that planned track. So uh, there's another positive development, though. Uh, because obviously there's a discussion now as to whether or not your sentence should, having having been swung one way, your then is then swings the other way, and there's a and there's a live discussion as to whether or not actually there should be some kind of reward in terms of time for you as a result of the actions that you yeah, took. Yeah, that, that wasn't my aim, but it, you know people saying you need time off, you need time off, and I thought okay, let's just go with the process. So Cal Turner, with the support of John Samuel's KC, a lawyer who've been helping me, they wrote a letter to Boris Johnson. I didn't know at the time, but Boris. Had given given Cal Turner his word that he would do all he can do all he can to help me, and so we asked him to, to to honour that pledge, and he did. A week later, I was given the royal prerogative of mercy, and the net effect of that was a reduction of how long. So I was I had ten months knocked off my minimum tariff for seventeen years, so my minimum tariff had been reduced from seventeen years to sixteen year two month. It wasn't a guarantee of parole, but it meant I could apply for parole a little bit earlier than normal. OK. And the parole process was not straightforward. There no. Were, there were some involved in that process <clears throat> who felt strongly uh, that despite what had happened, the risk, you know, that, that they argued that sat within you for violence remained. That was, yeah. essen that was essentially... <clears throat> their argument there yeah. were others arguing passionately in the reverse i could get that's the parole yeah. process and that and that well, and, no, the parole the parole were great and i can come to that in a moment and i, and I can explain why i think it's it's important for them to understand that and for mm. me to understand it but when my dossier had been brought to me there was and, and the, the mapper board had been involved and there was a, a recommendation for me to do um a what they said, one of the things that they said was that I'd been violent towards a terrorist offender. And, yeah, I had, but not in the normal sense of the word. It was a quite an extreme situation. You could call it, I don't know... Uh, it was re quite, an reasonable force, quite an extreme. Re reasonable force <laughs> in the sense that we could call it that, couldn't we? But that term, violence towards a terrorist perpetrator, and then they said, you know, we recommend that Mr Gallant do a, a, re a violent, violent risk, assess risk assessment of violence, you know... Uh, Mr. Gallant needs to look at his motivations and intentions and stuff like that. And then there was a uh, a suggestion that I should be um, gagged from from speaking to the press. So suddenly we had an extra load of boxes that need to be ticked and dealt with prior to the parole board, and it could have delayed it and, and and put us off. So I was, yeah, I was really sort of struck by all that because I thought, well, okay, yeah, I had used violence, but look at my prison record: fourteen and a half years, nothing. You know, look at what I'd achieved in prison. I'd done all sorts of things. And then taking that into account, and I think the problem is with, with the HPPS and the Ministry of Justice, you know, they have a tick box for shoplifter, tick box for a rapist, tick box for, for a murderer. Yeah, understandable. There isn't one for hero or lifesaver. So I just slotted back into that murderer tick box. But they did ask me, and rightly so, the pro board did say to me, look, do you know the difference between what you did on 
you know, at your in, during your index offence and on what happened during the during the you know the the incident on London Bridge, and I I articulated that I explained the differences between why, you know, what was behind underlying my uh, motivation to attack my my victim and what was underlying the, the motivation to attack um, or to to stop husband can't from others. So I explained them, and they, they, you know that that's all it took really. And I articulated that, and, and so I was happy with it. And it was at that point that you know, shortly after that the Pro Board said to me, Mr Gallant, good luck for the future. Being released from prison, how did that feel? I was already travelling backwards and forwards to, to Oxford anyway and, you know, feeling freedom. Um, it was nice, it's good, but it's not... When you're, when you're serving a life sentence, you're on licence. You're, you're on licence, well, you're, you, it's for the rest of your life. You know, you could get recalled to prison for the rest of your life, so you're never fully free. But of course, it was nice to finally walk away from the prison and not have someone looking over me and and go to McDonald's and go to wherever and just enjoy. So you don't certain feel, things. you don't feel free now. I feel free, um, but I'm constantly aware that there is this overriding thing that could pull me back to prison at any point. You know, looking over me, and although it's unlikely, given what I do in life and I'm, I'm you know I'm engaging well, I'm I'm integrated now. I'm helping other people. Um, I'm working. It's still there, you know. And you're in a relationship now. You're in a relationship. I'm in a relationship. Yeah. Yeah. So life is normalising. Normalised. Yeah. But do you feel like life will never be normal? I mean, is you, are you, you know, where and where are you on the sort of acceptance of that? I suppose, and the way that you accepted the situation when you were convicted, are you as accepting about this next phase of your life? Yeah. Look, you know, I, I the, the price. I mean, look, I've taken someone's life, and and they can they they can't even experience even what I'm experiencing on license. So therefore, you know, that's the price and that is the, the British law. You take a life and it impacts you for the rest of your life. So I, I get that. You well, know? you get it. Do you agree with it? Well, I think well, it depends. I mean, I, I would love to see a situation where after 10 years of good behaviour in the community, you could apply, for example, to have your license terminated because if someone's behaving for 10 years and they're contributing and perhaps even helping other prisoners um, reintegrate into society, uh, and reducing numbers of crime and stuff like that, um, then why not? What is the benefit of keeping someone on life license? They've clearly changed. They're never going to go back to it. So, and the one, the, the, another reason behind that is because the probation stage lack resources anyway. So why, why put resources into somebody who's clearly changed and, 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 and reintegrated when you can focus that on people who need it? Steve, tell me about life now. You've got busy, to put it mildly. I am very uh, busy, yeah. You set up, a, you set up an organisation, uh -huh. actually, with one of those two other guys that you uh, that you acted in you know, alongside um, with in, uh, on London Bridge. Tell me about Own Merit. We do have a house now in Northampton, and it's got currently got three or four guys in there. And we yeah, provide housing to prison leavers uh, and support with trying to find employment and we do that because we both know that when someone leaves prison uh, and, and finds himself in settled accommodation, they are 50% less likely to commit offences or to re-offend. So there's a huge benefit in, in providing prison leavers with somewhere to live. And that increases further when you, you get them in employment and, of course, provide the same types of support. So Own Merit tries to, to, to... It's a very small part of that huge jigsaw, but it tries to, 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 to deal with those, those elements. And that's what Darren and I have, have been sort of working on over the last. Sort You're of also three working years. with uh, Howard League. You're yeah. a fundraiser, quite involved in that organisation. Yes. Howard League, absolutely at the forefront of sort of prison reform. Yeah. Where are you at the moment in terms of the atmosphere around that debate? Obviously, we've seen some very recently seen some uh, policy changes from within government. Yeah. People with lower sentences, it seems, will not be going to prison, or fewer of them anyway. What's your view on where we're heading? On, on the whole prison debate? Um, I think Alex Chalk seems to be much more, much better than um, the previous uh, Justice Secretary and possibly the one before that, I'm not sure. Um, but I, look, the prison system has been going in the wrong direction, I think, for a long time. Ultimately, you know, the, the vast majority of people going to prison come out again at some point, so how do you want them to be? You want them to be able to reintegrate and possibly contribute if necessary. So it's... It's important that you you have the resources and, and and stuff to make sure that people when they go to prison 
you know, come out in, in, in a better shape. And currently we're not doing that. You know, prisons are massively under-resourced, understaffed, and it just doesn't seem to be working. I just want to say thank you. You're welcome. Um, for coming in, sitting here, telling us your quite astonishing story. Um, the book is, uh, is a hell of a read. It's very compelling. Oh, good, yeah. well, I'm, I'm glad you uh, and, liked it. And we should explain, it isn't a book just about those events on London Bridge. It is about your journey to it. Yeah. And you're very frank, very open, very honest about um, failings, the, uh, uh, the history that sits behind uh, your story. Uh, all of it, I think, incredibly valuable. Well, thank yeah. you for sharing it with us today. No, it's that, really appreciated. You're very, very welcome. But I just want to say that, you know, I do talk about my crime. I give a raw account of my crime. And part of the reason for that is because, you know, I learned some great lessons, some valuable lessons from my journey. And I think I want the reader to sort of also learn or take from those, the, the, my journey too. And I think you can only really do that if you follow me and come through some of those really raw moments with me in my book. And that's probably right why I've, I've put it in there. Very good. Mm. Um, Steve, I'm going to ask you for your crisis comforts. Crisis uh, we ask uh, we ask our guests to give us the three things that they kind of have relied on, lent on. Can't be another person during the toughest of times. So for you, what would you, uh, what three things would you uh, would you focus on? I, when I was deep in, in the bowels of the prison system, and things were terrible, and I had this long way to go, um, potentially never never getting out again. Of course, I just switched the perspective. On, on what was happening, I I knew that. Look, I mean, I was I was still healthy. I, you know, I still I, I could still eat. I could still educate myself. Uh, there were still opportunities within the prison system. Uh, I was still alive. You know. And yet, there are other people in the world who are free, and still don't have the things that I had. So I thought, well, at least I've got all these things. You know, and that taking that perspective was comforting for me to know that there's always somebody worse off, always somebody worse off. I'm alive, I've got opportunities here, and I can get through this. That was one of them. Very good. The other two? Oh, yeah. The other two. Something specific? I, I missed, I missed... What was your comfort in, what was your comfort in, 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 in prison? My comfort? Something is a... Well, simple, a... No, a, a, a simple comfort for me was I just took the kettle and have a cup of tea. Yeah. I love a cup of tea, you know? I love Yorkshire tea bags, you know? That's what I used to do at home with mum years ago, have a cup of tea. So always, always have the some tea bags. The power of a cup of tea. <laughs> always have some tea bags. It's and truly it, enhanced yeah. when you're in prison. It, it is. Oh, yeah. I mean, you can't beat it. I mean, I love a cup of tea. So having a cup of tea and just relaxing. I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, if you can keep physically healthy, that helps the mind, doesn't it? So I, well, when I went to prison, I stopped smoking. I stopped drinking. You can get drink in prison in the form of hooch. I didn't bother with any drugs. I didn't. I wasn't a big drug taker, but I liked to party drugs. Um, but I stopped all of that overnight, and that helped clear my mind. But then, yeah, I started to get into the physical exercise. I've always done a little bit of rugby or summit in life, but by the time I went to prison, I've been I've not been doing it for a few years. So, going to prison gave me the opportunity to sort of start getting to the gym proper and just making sure I I, I yeah I was I was, I was um, disciplined enough to, to to just go to the gym as much as possible and just, you know, physically get myself in a really good shape. I mean, there's, there's, there's two reasons behind that. One, it's good mentally. Two, keeping yourself physically in shape um, helps you to keep the odd idiot at bay as well because it keeps them second guessing too. Because where I was going was somewhere quite dark, so I had to be physically in shape too, which I think helped a little bit. Outstanding. Steve Gallant, thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome, thank you. If you've enjoyed this episode, please do give us a rating and a review. It really helps. And if you hit subscribe, wherever you download your podcast from, you'll find loads more useful crisis conversations. You can follow us on Instagram and TikTok, and you can watch the full episodes on YouTube. Just search for Crisis What Crisis Podcast. You can also find full transcripts of this and every episode on our website, crisiswhatcrisis.com. Thanks again for joining us.